The riffs are too repetitive, the lyrics make no sense All the songs are b-sides and the cover art's a mess There's so much here to tear apart Listen to it for a week Now that we has passed Why I hate this album Podcast with Tim and Garrett Hello and welcome to another episode of Why I Hate This Album I am one of your hosts with me as always, co-host extraordinaire, Kylo DeMaihan, Timothy Richardson. Tim, how the hell are you doing, buddy? I'm doing great, Garrett. It is 2021. Nothing at all will go wrong this year. Nothing. I, on the very day we're recording this, Tim, I would argue many things have already gone terrifically wrong just today. Not for me. Oh, okay. Well, huh. So the, all this time, your good cheer and positive outlook has been based solely on how 2021 should be for you. Yes. I don't know why I ever thought it was anything but utter selfishness. Uh, you know what? This is on me. I apologize. <laughs> Tim, what the hell song are we talking about this week? We are discussing Charles Berry's version of the weird and maybe gross song, My Dingaling, released in 1972. And Garrett, you'll notice <laughs> this week, I chose <laughs> against the recommendation of Gino, I chose not to dress like Chuck Berry. Garrett, I dress like Marty McFly. Yeah, you look great. I love the puffy vest. Yeah. But- Wait, hold on. <laughs> when you say dress like Chuck Berry. Yeah. Yes, yeah, I do mean that. Oh. Right. That's oh. what Gino wanted. Garrett, he's a very old Italian man. He, he, do you want to describe for the listeners what that would entail? Nope. Yeah, that's best. Yeah. But <laughs> Garrett, I spent 100 hours this week slightly editing Back to the Future and then writing, filming, and editing two alternate sequels. What? what? I, I suppose this is a good question to ask. And it slipped right by me. Apologies, Tim. Again, take me through it again now. Why are you dressed like... Hold on. You know what? Let me see if I got this right. You are dressed just like Marty McFly, because you have been making your own trilogy of Back to the Future using primarily already shot footage starring Michael J. Fox. No. The first one is almost <laughs> entirely the same. The only difference in the first movie is that I have changed Johnny B. Good to this song. Oh. Completely scrapped the next two sequels. I completely redid those, Garrett. I was the, the director. I was the editor. I was the main star. Gino played uh, a couple of characters, but they have nothing to do with Marty McFly at this point, Garrett. In the first movie, Chuck Berry steals this song back in 1958, a full 15 years before this comes out. Right. You know that most of rock and roll appears to be based on the song Johnny Be Good, right? Of course. So, in these other two sequels that I have made, all the music in the 60s and then subsequently through today was based on my dingling instead of Johnny Be Good. Well, boy, I am a cauldron of emotion here. <laughs> Tim, first of all, I applaud the effort. Any independent artistry is always welcome here on this show. Send in your, your pictures, your stories, your bizarre emails, heypodmail gmail.com. Yeah, create two but, sequels to Back to the Future based on an idea you have and send them to us. Yes, please do that as well. But Tim, you specifically in this case, I got a real problem with what you've done here for Back to the Future 2 because that movie is great. Oh, absolutely. I love it. Right. But it's gone. But you, <laughs> It's gone. It's it gone. doesn't exist it's anymore. Gone. It well, I don't is, think that's true. Check the DVD <laughs> shelf. Oh, okay. Well, just give me a moment. Great Scott. <laughs> yeah, it's been replaced by a DVD that has my handwriting on it. Yeah, and it also almost certainly has 1998's Godzilla in it, if I had to guess. <laughs> a lot of the footage is Godzilla, I will admit that. <laughs> But the music, God, you love Nick to top the list. soundtrack, it, it doesn't matter. It, to answer your question, yeah, there's some cowboy stuff in there. Okay, that's what I figured. I couldn't imagine you passed up the opportunity to set an entire film in the West. <laughs> well, right, right. Ugh, I don't care for that third one. Okay, we've gone wildly off topic, and I haven't even asked the titular question. Tim, do you hate this song? I don't know. What? It, I mean, here's the thing. Garrett, this sucks. It is a novelty song, so it's hard to really... Yeah. Really hate it, I guess, but you have to think about how many people like this, how many people bought this, how many people in the audience are singing along on the song, and we will get there. People listen to oh, this. Yeah. This was pop. You know, I think I might hate this because <laughs> this is beneath him. I got tired of listening to this song on repeat. I got the 20th yeah. Century Masters Greatest Hits series thing for Chuck Berry. Mm-hmm. He's so good at music, Garrett. And this is on there. This is one of the songs they included. Did they include the live version or the studio version? 
version. This version. Yeah. This is beneath him. This is not good. I think I hate this song. You got me wow. there. Wow. Jeez. Yeah. I mean, I'll give you some credit. You did a lot of the heavy <laughs> lifting, but I did kick things off. Wow. Yeah. Oh, you know, Tim, there might be a problem with your new Back to the Future trilogy, if only for the fact that this song is set to the tune of Little Brown Jug, which predates Johnny B. Good. So if all music was going to be- I wonder oh, if it no, just sorry, has to be sorry. played by Chuck Perry. It's, there is music beforehand, of course. It's just well, that yeah. instead of stealing Johnny B. Good and introducing that in 1958 or 1956, possibly, he introduces this. So John Lennon, the Rolling Stones, mm, the Beach Boys, they were all listening to My Dingling instead of Johnny B. Good. And so they based their music off of this garbage. I could see John Lennon and Paul McCartney both really liking My Dingling for the complete opposite reasons. <laughs> Accurate. Garrett, do you hate this song? Ooh, boy, I don't know. Tim, I was ready to come in here with a very comfortable no, I don't hate this. But you have already, in the first seven, eight minutes of recording, really put together a compelling case as to why I ought to hate this. But nope, it's the start of the show. We'll ask it again at the end. So for now, no, I do not hate it, but I highly anticipate the possibility that I get there. I'm going to go microwave my hands. Uh, gross. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Tim, I'm curious. Prior to this week, what is your history with Mr. Charles Berry and his dingling? I mean, like everyone that's eaten at his restaurant, he has more familiarity with my dingling than I do with his. But for quite a <laughs> while, <laughs> it took me a second to figure out the bridge you were building, sir. But that is a joke about cameras in the toilet. <laughs> Something <laughs> Chuck Berry has been accused of doing. We'll get there. For quite a while, I thought that this song was a Simpsons joke. My first experience exposure to this was the My Dingling Kid on The Simpsons. He kind of looks like Milhouse. He's voiced by Joanne Harris. And he sang this song at a talent show in Lisa's Pony before Principal Skinner pulls him off stage. Yeah, I was an early up. Yeah, I was unaware that this was a song for a very long time. But I, you know, obviously the first time I heard it, I knew it instantly from that. I'm not sure that I'd ever heard this version, the live version, the Chuck Berry version. I definitely never heard the Dave Bartholomew original. Original. No. I don't know why anyone would cover this. I could see why you might cover this half drunk live. Sure. You know that John Lennon anthology, like the four or five CD set where he just dicks around for half the time? Yes. Yeah, that's when this is appropriate. Sure. I think live show, great. Yeah, this is not for your 20th century master's career retrospective. What about you, Gary? Is this the first time Chuck has ever buried your dingling? Good lord. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm going to say it is. Um, it in my defense, I, I I was just rearranging the words according to a formula we established years ago. I apologize for how that came off. Yeah. I'm not sure you fully realize what you just propositioned. <laughs> anyway, I know Chuck Berry because I have ears. I knew this song existed, but it, I don't know if I knew the chorus from The Simpsons or possibly just kids at school because I've never heard Chuck Berry sing this song prior to this week. There's no reason you should have. Let me just say though, and I guess we'll, yeah, we'll see how much you want to get into it this week. Chuck Berry, what a man of all seasons. Because my history with him is so multifaceted from a very young Garrett seeing Back to the Future before Tim may or may not have ruined it. And, you know, literally any oldie station, anybody who's interested in rock music, eventually, if you do any research, you realize, oh, okay, like a lot of it started right here. Yeah. With um, my dingling. No. Uh, yes. Then, watch the movies. Then there's the accusations, Tim. <laughs> and I'm not going to get into any details here. That's not my role on this show. But I'm just going to say, after Charles Berry kind of fades from memory and you think, you know, he's an old man off living old old man life, he pops back up now and again with some pretty atrocious uh, accusations. Yeah, he's like Neil Young in that Neil Young produces an album every year. Most of them are pretty good. Some of them are great. Some of them are terrible. Chuck Berry Fair. commits a crime every year. Some of them are pretty good. Some <laughs> of them are just okay. Some of them are filming women in a restroom. He likes to watch women poop, allegedly. Now- wow. Yes. It's a shame he never got together with Dave Matthews. They could have had a lot of fun. Oh my God. Talk about uh, yin and yang there. <laughs> <laughs> one's going to drop it and the other one's going to watch it. Now, just 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 curiosity, Tim. Let's say for a moment that Chuck does enjoy watching women poop. Is it better, worse, or the same 
if he doesn't like watching women poop, he likes watching women poop in reverse. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. So I think the question you're asking is, does he have a fetish for giving himself seizures? Yeah, right. Because that will open a portal to hell if you watch somebody's feces go into them. Yeah. 100% of the time, it will give you a seizure. It's less weird, I think. I think, honestly, if, if he's into having seizures, that's less weird than if he likes to watch women poop exclusively. Sure. Maybe he's one of the few that doesn't seize and he finds it. Well, I don't know what he finds it. I'm not going to. Well, I'm going to throw up. Um, oh, I've got mouth sweats. Yeah, you do. Oh. Yeah, you're, oh. you're leaking fluid, friend. Good Lord. Anyway, I think it's weirder if he wants to watch it in reverse, but grosser if he wants to watch it the normal way. There it is. Yes, sir. All right. Moving on. That's your history. That's my history. And that's an odd conversation about pooping in reverse. <laughs> that brings us to the artist's history. Before we can talk about the song itself, we need to know a little bit about Mr. Berry and how my dingling came to be. So, Tim, take us on a journey. Help us understand who is Chuck Berry. Well, Garrett, you kind of stole my thunder here. Charles Edward Anderson Berry, or Chuck Berry, as I have nicknamed him, was born in mm -hmm. 1926 in St. Louis, Missouri. He had a very early interest in music and would perform for the first time publicly in 1941. However, in 1944, when he was 17 or 18, he robbed three stores in Kansas City, then stole a car at gunpoint, and was sent to a reform school for three years until his 21st birthday. So far, fully forgivable. Yes. He did occasionally get to leave child jail, though, because he and a few of his <laughs> crime buddies were good at singing, and so they let them perform as a quartet around the state. 1948, 22 years old now, he gets married, and he had to take a bunch of non-crime jobs to support his new family. He was a janitor, he was a factory worker, he was a cosmetologist slash beautician, a couple other things. Hmm. And this was a time in America when you could like buy a house and raise a kid on a beautician salary. Wow. But he started playing in bands to get extra money. He took some guitar lessons and did a bunch of like blues and country music playing as a supporting person in, in other people's band. All the while he's developing this very elaborate stage act and this showmanship that he would become known for. And this was also a time he kind of hit it just at the right time because this is when white audiences were starting to get interested in black music. What would have been five to ten years earlier, a much more narrow market is now suddenly wide open for him, kinda. You know, it's wide open, but it's still not going to be that pleasant. Yeah, we shouldn't gloss over the fact that America still chock full of racism at that point. Yeah, also kind of today. Anyway, he meets Muddy Waters in Chicago. Muddy Waters gets him in touch with Leonard Chess of Chess Records, and he records some songs. His first recording was a rendition of an earlier song. He called it Maybelline. It hit number one on the R&B chart and sold over a million copies. I had no idea Maybelline was his first song. Hey, here's my first effort, guys. What do you, what do you think? <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yeah. yeah, well, I mean- Who taught you guitar? <laughs> he then becomes friends with Carl Perkins. He commented immediately upon hearing him do, you know, what we know as like 1955, 1956, Chuck Berry. He goes, you used to play with country musicians, huh? Oh. <laughs> Which is interesting. Rollover Beethoven becomes a pretty big hit. And then he gets to tour with the Everly Brothers and Buddy Holly. He has a number of other like really big hits at this point. School Days, Rock and Roll Music, the creepily titled Sweet Little Sixteen, and mm. uh, most famous famously Johnny B. Good. Unfortunately, Garrett, Sweet Little Sixteen was giving him too much credit. He was arrested in 1959 <sighs> under the Mann Act after almost certainly being guilty of having sex with a 14-year-old. So, I don't know if you're familiar with the Mann Act. Not intimately, no. That, basically, it says that it's a felony to engage in interstate or foreign commerce to transport women or girls for the purpose of prostitution or debauchery or for any other immoral purpose. Oh, that was the law that Stephen and Tyler was subverting by adopting the girl first. Exactly. Yes. So Jesus. I don't think that he was ever in trouble for having sex with the 14-year-old. I think he was in trouble because he then transported her across state lines to work as a hat check girl at a club. I bet you have that reversed because I think if you brought her to another state to get a job as a hat check girl, boy, talk about a job that they ain't here anymore. <laughs> if your job is to collect hats for Chuck Berry, your job is to have sex with Chuck Berry. Oh, you know what? Truth told. But I think that the problem the law had really was the taking her across state lines, not the statutory rape. Jesus. Anywho, bunch of trials and appeals later, 
during which Chuck continued to record and tour. He eventually got one and a half years in prison, but again, probably not for statutory raping anyone. While he was in prison, the Beatles and the Rolling Stones happened. They started performing his songs live, recording some of his songs. The Beach Boys used the melody of Sweet Little Sixteen for Surf in USA. And when he got out of prison, he released a number of fairly successful singles, a live album, and he was a really big draw as a live act. He was a weird live act, though. What he liked to do is tour as a solo musician, and then basically the venue had to provide him with a local backing band that he had not rehearsed any of his songs, and then he just went out and did his thing. I demand this be terrible. I don't think it was, though. (laughs) I think it was just every show is just wildly different. That all depends on who the fuck you've got behind you. I've also heard that Chuck Berry, and I'm sure you're going to continue to get into it, Tim, is a son of a bitch. Yeah, (laughs) he definitely is. In 1972, he released a live version of My Dingling, the song of the week. A lot of radio stations refused to play this. British morality campaigner, using quotey fingers there, Mary Whitehouse, tried to get the song banned in the UK. It was unsuccessful. She wrote, One teacher told us of how she found a class of small boys with their trousers undone, singing the song and giving it the indecent interpretation which, in spite of all the hullabaloo, is so obvious. We trust you will agree with us that there is no part of the function of the BBC to be the vehicle of songs which stimulate this kind of behavior. Indeed, quite the reverse. All right, two questions. One, do you think that actually happened? No. Two, if it had, is there anything wrong with it? I mean, I don't want to be that teacher because you come in and that's the the day that Superintendent Chalmers is coming by. Yeah. For this song and for a lot of the live shows during this period in the early 70s, Chuck Berry allegedly insisted on being paid in cash. Now, that results Mm. in a tax evasion Asian conviction in a four-month prison sentence. I like that undoubtedly Chuck Berry was like, here's the thing. I get paid in cash so they don't know I'm making money and I never have to pay taxes. And the 900th person that, that he told that to replied the exact same way. You should probably not do that. Yeah. And absolutely. he's just like, no, no, no. It's foolproof. Yeah. How can they know? There's no receipts. Which I guess before computers is slightly more likely to happen. Garrett, it was 1974 and he went to prison for four months. Oh yeah. They know exactly exactly what he's up to. Yeah. 1975, he releases the album Chuck Berry. He released the album Rocket in 1979. And then when he was 90, 38 years <laughs> later, he released his next album Chuck in 2017. But during this period, he continues to tour a bunch. In the 80s, he played between 70 and 100 shows every year, all again traveling by himself, getting local bands to back him up. 1987, he's charged with assaulting a woman. She had lacerations of the mouth, contusions of the face, two loose teeth and required a bunch of face stitches, he pleaded guilty to harassment and paid a fine of $250. Harass those teeth right on out of her head. That's right. In 1990, he was sued by a whole slew of ladies claiming that he installed a video camera in a bathroom at a restaurant he owned, uh, again, uh, probably to see ladies poop. Or poop in reverse. Yes. He did not deny that that camera was there. He did not deny that he put it there. He just claimed it was to catch an employee stealing. Unclear (laughs) what. She keeps putting hams in her vagina. She keeps (laughs) That poop keeps going in and then she leaves. (laughs) She's stealing my toilet's poop. (laughs) Garrett, he settled a class action lawsuit. Take a guess at how many women. 41. Not too bad. 59. 59 (laughs) women. Here's the thing. I may have more to say about this one fact than I do this whole song. So let me get into it. To have a class action lawsuit against you (laughs) for anything, an individual, is insane. Class action lawsuits are almost always, I shouldn't say almost always, I'm not a lawyer, very frequently to an organization, a body, a company that has wronged a large group of people because harming enough people to necessitate a class action lawsuit is almost impossible for an individual. Oh, yeah. In the event that it happens, typically you would expect it to be financial in nature, you know, large, certain multiple transactions, failing to perform services rendered, blah, blah, blah. I think there are multiple transactions involved here. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. (laughs) To have a class action lawsuit for watching women poop, or you know what? Let's class it up. For camera toilets. (laughs) Toilet cameras. I like that they're not toilet cameras. They're they're camera toilets. (laughs) Yeah, listen, I put a toilet around this camera. (laughs) 
<laughs> Prove me wrong. Listen, I put a toilet around this camera. Garrett Harvey in conversation no. one five twenty twenty one. Well, there you go, folks. That's how it's done. <laughs> that, yeah. that is damning. Yep. Okay. Um, so the other side of the coin, Tim. Like I said, I have a lot of thoughts here. To be an individual who is filmed in the most private of acts, Tim. I don't want to be filmed pooping like shotgun style, like looking down the barrel. Let alone, actually, you know, maybe it's better have it on the old Dave and Buster's and, and round back. I mean, it's a lot harder to identify for sure. But in any event, to have that happen to you is so invasive, so wrong that you would want restitution, justice, both financially and criminally. But to have so many people it has been done to that you're only going to see a fraction of that money. Like, had it just been you, huge payday. This is Chuck Berry. He is not poor. But it's how many did you say? 60? 59. 59 people. You're going to get like 20 grand. Garrett, he paid out $1.2 million. That comes out to $20,338.98 per woman whom he filmed pooping. Jesus Christ. You're pretty damn close. Our legal system at work, ladies and gentlemen, some asshole with a nut with a million dollars can watch 60 women poop in reverse. Enjoy it, Bezos. All right. Chuck's house was also raided by police who found, and I'm quoting here, intimate videotapes of women, one of whom was apparently a minor, and some pot. He was charged with felony drug and child abuse charges. The child abuse charges were dropped completely, and he was given a six-month suspended jail sentence for misdemeanor possession of marijuana because we, as a nation, have our priorities straight. He's not a good person. No. In 2000, his longtime pianist, Johnny Johnson, sued him. Him, claiming that he co-wrote over 50 of the songs, including Sweet Little 16 and Roll Over Beethoven. That was dismissed by a judge who said, that was a while ago. What? Yeah. It was what do you mean? It was dismissed by a judge. The judge ruled that too much time had passed since the songs were written. Hmm. It was a while ago. Okay. I guess stuff stops being a crime after a while. It sometimes does. And, and save your tweets. I know how statute limitations work, fuck faces. <laughs> <laughs> and then in 2017, Charles Berry announced that he was going to release an album after 38 years, and then he died in his home in Wentzville, Missouri. Now, TMZ got a hold of the 911 call, but nothing else. So presumably, Chuck had a really good friend, a Garrett, if you will, to get rid of his yellow shoebox filled with his unspeakables. Mm, I would imagine it's more of a um, you store it situation. <laughs> There's a yellow shoebox filled with things that he's not ashamed of. There it is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, all the rest, just burn it. Just, <laughs> yeah. There's just a button and it's all like, it's like, did you ever see that Mel Gibson movie where he sets his whole house to burn down when Charles Xavier comes to get him? He's part of the CIA. You know what I'm talking about? Nope. Good talk. After his death, Robert Criscow said that he considers Barry the greatest of the rock and rollers. John Lennon said, if you had to give rock and roll another name, you might call it Chuck Barry. Obviously, he didn't say that after his death, given that he died some 37 years before him. Ted Nugent said, if you don't know every Chuck Berry lick, you can't play rock guitar. Bob Dylan called okay. Barry the Shakespeare of rock and roll. Hmm. He was also, coincidentally, uh, something that, that Tim Richardson called him, the Shakespeare of Go Toilet cans. But that's his history, Garrett. Wow, what a storied past. So I, it's quite a dichotomy, Tim, because on the one hand, his contribution to music and more specifically the heart of rock and roll is immeasurable. Well, it, it was, Garrett, because his contribution now is my dingling in 1958. Watch the movies. No, no, I'm not going to buy into your alternate universe. <laughs> also, no one can get a copy of this. Well, it's good. I mean, uh, I don't have a distribution deal yet, but Gino knows people. Yeah, you can get in contact with A24. Or maybe Blumhouse is sniffing around. No, no, there's those Israeli brothers. Uh, Canon. Possibly. Tim, Canon Pictures went out of business easily 25 years ago. <laughs> oh, well, then I, in any event. I've really mistaken my business plan here. You usually do. You know what, Tim? We can make copies. We'll get you a little DVD burner. We can put it up on the store. Heypod.com backslash store. We'll be there any day now, folks. Any day. Keep checking back. Keep a tab open. Just refresh it. Save yourself some time. And while you're there, you can click on contact us in the upper left-hand corner. We want to hear from you. Anyway, Tim, great history. Really enjoyed the balance. A lot of rock and roll. I was spurred this week to watch old Chuck Berry videos in preparation and basically watch all of the performances that I like so much more than this song. Mm -hmm. Did you do any of that? I did. I didn't realize how many different times he played with like Lennon and the Stones. Like there's a whole bunch of different collaborations you can 
can watch online. I, I assume you watched the legendary John Lennon, Chuck Berry, Yoko Ono performance? I didn't, no. Oh my God, do yourself a favor, gang. And please, I don't want anyone to think I'm stealing bits here. Uh, Bill Burr does an excellent uh, breakdown of the video. I don't know where, but uh, I'll give you Garrett's version. Chuck Berry, John Lennon playing together live on TV. It's going amazing. It's everything that John Lennon could want it to be. Like he looks like a kid just grinning. But guess who's in the corner with a microphone? (laughs) (laughs) It's Yoko. And she's quiet. She's playing a tambourine, I think. No big deal. There's other people up there. So you don't really hear anything. And then Tim, she steps to the microphone and I'm going to scoot back so I don't hurt anybody's ears. And she does this. (laughs) Why? Why? Anyway, do yourself a favor and watch it. There's also one. This one's a little less obvious. You got to know the backstory, but you can see Chuck Perry playing with Keith Richards and it's a great performance, except Keith Richards years later, 25 years later was like, yeah, that whole thing was really fucked up. I'm so excited. It was going great. We're jamming together. And right in the middle, Chuck leans over and he starts complaining that he doesn't like how the guitars are set and he wants us to change all the pedals. And so you can see in the video, he just keeps leaning over and going like, what, mate? What? No, no, no. No, we're halfway through the song, man. And it's like live. Like, we're not going to... No. It's it's entertaining. I don't know if that one's as fun, but the Yoko one, please do look it up. If you like Bill Burr, you'll enjoy it even more watching him give the play-by-play. All right. He's a titan of his time and a pervert. Yeah. So before we can talk about the song, let's give everybody a little taste. I mean, go out and listen to it, folks. It's really not that long. A little repetitive, but in case you're unable to, here's a quick taste of Chuck Berry's stunning My Ding-A-Ling. Hilarious. Yeah. This is a song for adults, I think. I think. You mentioned, again, this is based on the 19th century folk song, Little Brown Jug. Did you listen to the David Bartholomew version? Of course not. Did you? I did, yeah. It's real big bandy. It's just, it's it's like a, well, no, it's not. But it's what you'd expect from, you know, this being produced in like 1956. Sure. But I really do not like the call and response thing he does with the audience. And a more fundamental question, Garrett. How often was he playing this? How popular was this song? Everyone knows it. No one should know this song. Well, to be fair, they do sing mostly the chorus and after the first time, you know it. Oh, sure. Okay, that's fair, but... I mm. think this was probably a staple for his touring at the time. This is his closer, I think. Yeah, which is a shame for people that go to his shows. Well, especially coming off the heels of all the other songs he almost certainly was playing, and then he's like, all right, we're going to wrap up with a real banger, (laughs) folks. Here we go. no, you know what? I like this. I like this. I would like to be able to skip the encore. Just play your songs and then come back and do my dingling so I know I don't have to stay. Ooh, that would be nice. I, Tim, I don't know about you. And we've had some really fun encores together at various shows that we've been to. But by and large, I could do without the encore. Yeah. I don't know that I've ever been to a non-festival show where somebody hasn't done an encore. Ooh, I know. You and I, you may not even remember this. You and I saw Kings of Leon. Oh, like, yeah. They played for like 35 minutes. Yep. There was no encore because they had no more songs. Yeah. That was when they had two albums and both those albums were good. Yeah. That, wow. Why were you hanging out with a boy? I too was a boy. Uh, we were boys together. You were, you were a man. I was but a boy. We smoked a pack of parliaments that night <laughs> at that at that 35 minute show. Yeah. Oh, oh God. I miss cigarettes. Of course. Yeah. Anyway, back to the song at hand, Tim. This is going to be the ba- most basic of of walkthroughs we've had in years. Just listen to the song. This was probably more an excuse to get into his backstory. Yeah, honestly, it's more fun to just talk about him than it is this song. But I mean, let's be ultra clear here. This is a song about penises. Yes, it is. So this is one of the songs that it's technically not, right? It's about a bell, but you can replace the dingling with penis in every instance and this whole thing makes sense. I would argue a bell does not make sense. Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's fair. But I mean, we can just, instead of saying my dingling, because that's going to get boring. We can just say my penis. Yeah. I wish there was a funny three-syllable word for penis. Penaling? How about that? My penaling. Also, my, <laughs> how's that better? It's There's got to be a three-syllable word for penis. Cock and balls. There it is. Tim, you little genius. You little <laughs> rhyming genius. You're the Shakespeare of cock and balls. Yeah, that's what I want to be known as. Well, we'll get it embroidered on your shirts. Lickety split. Anyway, uh, you want to kick things off, Tim, or you want me to? I'll get it started. Well, he begins this with this weird little 
little introduction, at least on the live version, the main version, where he refers to this song as their alma mater. Sure. And I, I guess we really should make it explicit that the one, the song we're going to be talking about is the live version that became, in, well, that is the most popular. Yes. When I was a little bitty boy, my grandmother bought me a cute little toy, silver bells hanging on a string. She told me it was my cock and balls. <laughs> My cock and balls, this is already my cock off. and balls, I want to play with my cock and balls. My cock and balls, my cock and balls, I want to play with my cock and balls. No, it's not I want to play. It says I want you to play with my cock and balls. I think he switches it back and forth. Can't it be both, right? Oh, yeah. And then my mother took me to grammar school, but I stopped all in the vestibule. Every time that bell would ring, catching me playing with my cock and balls. <laughs> my cock and balls, my cock and balls. I want to play with my cock and balls, or possibly I want you to play with my cock and balls, depending. Also, won't you play with my cock and balls? <laughs> yeah. Goddamn this song. Tim, we've really improved it. I want to say way better. Yeah, it is a better song to just come out and say it. Once I was climbing the garden wall, I slipped and had a terrible fall. I fell so hard. I heard bells ring, but I held on to my cock and balls. All right, hold on. Don't go into the chorus yet. <laughs> Did you know what a vestibule was? Yes. Oh, I didn't. It's a hallway. Mm -hmm. Usually when a short say... hallway. Not always. What? When did you become Johnny Vestibule? <laughs> Man, well, you and I went to very different schools. I went to a Texas public school, but like, especially in elementary school, there were like four or five kids in each grade that had like serious behavioral issues. There would be the kid who like just keeps taking his dick out. Do you didn't have any of that in your school? I mean, no. We, again, we, we went to different we schools. <laughs> Yeah, we sure did. Yeah, friend. you. I mean, had you gone to my school, I would have had a guy at my school doing this. No, no, I was not that child. That child was clearly in a very difficult home situation. I feel bad about it now, but yeah, absolutely. Uh, but I would argue, given the picture you have painted of your home situation, you were in a very bad home situation. Yeah, but I was much more prone to act out with anger and tempers. Oh yeah, you were more violent and punchy. Still am. Yep, my face bleeds uh, daily. Well, nightly. I wake up. That's right. When you slap me in my sleep. <laughs> Those are punches. Okay, Tim, question. You, you read the part about him climbing on the garden wall. What's he doing on that wall? Sounds like we might have a little bit of some peeping. Garrett, Chuck Berry is a peeper. There's a lot of people that have songs that have allusions to peeping. There's a lot of people that flirt a little bit with peeping. There's a lot of people that draw pictures of me peeping. But with Chuck Berry, uh, yeah. there's documented evidence. There's Yeah, that is true. I guess I can't... I, I, well, allegedly. No, I, I mean, was, yeah, okay, okay. But it cost him $20,000 a person. And there were so many people. Yes. God damn. Yeah, he was out on that wall with his cock and balls out and he fell and almost ripped his dick off. I think he just fell and hit his head. Nope, my version. Okay. Once I was swimming across Turtle Creek, many snappers all around my feet. Sure was hard swimming across that thing with both my hands holding my cock and balls. <laughs> Is he swimming naked? Is that what I we're to believe so, yeah. Because, I mean, he's worried about those turtles biting his cock and balls. Which he should be if there's even rumor of cock and balls turtles. Don't go in that water. Yeah, anywhere there's a turtle, keep your wiener in your pants. That's the why I hate this album official recommendation. Yeah, that is our stance. Now, Tim, I'm curious. Have you ever swum? That can't be right. Have you ever gone swimming nude in the lake or pond? No, I haven't. I almost did. I was- Oh, oh God. you <laughs> chickened out. I get it. Oh, I did, but I, not. it's not what you think. I was six. <laughs> <laughs> And it was just me and like three of my friends and we were going there to like some guys, some oh, one of our friends. No, 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 no. One of our friend's dads had like a, had a boat and he was just like, oh, I'm going to go change the battery or something. And then we got there and we're like, oh, we could actually go swimming. We're going to be here for a while, but we didn't bring bathing suits. We we're such six. a mature six year old. No, no, we're six. So the dad was just like, if you guys want to just swim, go swimming. And we were all going to, but we were at Possum Kingdom Lake, famed oh, Toadie song. Yeah. And somebody casually mentioned that there's water moccasins in that lake. Like, be sure to jump out. Don't climb down because those holes are filled with snakes. Oh. And I was like, oh, I'm not going to do this now. Not at all. <laughs> so I did chicken out, but it was because I was scared of wiener snakes. Now, let me ask you this, Garrett. Are you still scared of wiener snakes? Absolutely. Yeah, you're right are to you be. Not? No, I'm not. Okay. Fully on board. Now, did any of your friends go swimming? No. After I backed out, it sort of rippled across the pond. <laughs> Once you broached the subject of wiener biting snakes, I get it. Yeah. Might have been uh, one of the few 
few times I showed real spine as a child. It's just like, yeah, I'm good, man. You showed real spine in your cowardice. That's right. Uh, continue, Tim. You're really doing a great job here. This year's song, It Ain't So Sad, the cutest little song you ever had. Those of you who will not sing, you must be playing with your own cock and balls. My cock and balls, your cock and balls, your cock and balls. We saw you playing with your cock and balls. My cock and balls. Everybody sing. I want to play with my cock and balls. Now, at this point, he's just berating the audience and those who refuse to sing this stupid fucking song along with him. Yeah, see, that would really bother me. I don't like my musicians telling me what I must do. Like, put your hands up, yeah, start clapping, sing along. Because here's the thing. Music should be, I mean, it's an artistic expression, right? I'm not here to square dance. If I want to be a bird, I'm going to be a goddamn bird. I'm high as fuck. You have lost me. I apologize. So, when I go to a show, Garrett, I'm going to do what I want. Whatever that is. Okay. And a lot of times, okay. that's get real high and be a bird, <laughs> you see? And I like to flap my arms. physically in, in the venue, right? You mean you get up in those rafters. Sometimes it leads to that, but it starts out with just flapping in my seat. Oh. <laughs> I have always wondered what that is. <laughs> I like that you've never asked. Well, you know, Tim, some stuff is so horrifying, you don't want to know the answer. Uh, I gotta say, honestly, not so bad. Yeah. I wish I'd ripped this Band-Aid off a decade ago. Yeah, but my, my, yeah, my point is that I agree with you. It shouldn't be a very orderly experience, right? You don't want yeah. to clap your hands. You don't want somebody to tell you to stand up. Or start dancing. If I don't want to dance, Tim, don't order me to dance. Absolutely this is not. Germany. And if I'm dancing and you tell me to stop, I'm gonna fucking peck those eyes out. Uh, again, back to those bird metaphors. Force. That's interesting. <laughs> Very bird-like. Why specifically a concert? Oh, you know what? Now that we're talking about it and we're in open dialogue, let me take this opportunity to ask, and coming from a place of vulnerability, I hope you really consider this. Would you stop? Stop what? The flapping. <laughs> the you're it, you're it. This is what I'm talking about. I don't like it when people tell me what to do at concerts. I'm gonna <laughs> flap and peck all over you. <laughs> All right. We have veered wildly, wildly, <laughs> of course. I mean, that's the whole fucking song. You got us all the way through it there, Tim. Way to go. I really like that we replaced it with Cock and Balls because it emphasizes how dumb this song is. Yes. And how much about Cock and Balls it is. Let me go ahead and ask it. How did this thing do? This was Chuck Berry's only number one hit on the Billboard Hot 100. I would say that's a real shame, but he's, you know, kind of a monster. Yeah. I mean, so. he had numerous number one hits hits on the R&B charts and whatnot, but this was the only one that officially hit number one overall. This was a gold record. It sold at least 500,000 copies in the US alone. It's not his best-selling record, but it is pretty close. This was a number one single in Canada, the UK, and Ireland as well. Number 29 in the Dutch, and according to Billboard, this was the 15th best-selling song of 1972. Why? It's beaten by American Pie, if that helps. Boy, some Day we're going to do that song. Yeah, we should do the Madonna version of it so we can both hate it. <laughs> well, I don't think the Madonna version's 18 minutes. 32, I believe. Oh, God. Now, Tim, I'm curious. You got me thinking. What is the most recent popular novelty song you can think of? There's that Will Smith song. If Willard. you say getting jiggy with it. No, of course not. Garrett. Garrett. <laughs> I am jiggy with it. No, but there was sure. the, the Nightmare on Elm Street song. There was the Wild Wild West. And Wild Wild West is not a novelty song. Well, I say this coming from the cowboy community. It's a fucking novelty song. Right. Well, that's not a real community and you guys are just a sex cult. I was going to say Fuck You Softly, Tenacious D. That was pretty popular, right? Yeah. WAP. WAP is a novelty song. WAP. I was going to say, that was the big challenge. Is WAP a novelty song? Wet ass pussy. No, no. Again, wrong emphasis on the wrong syllable. Mm. Wet ass pussy. Yeah. Wet ass pussy. Mm, again, I'm seeing a really hard ass I want wet ass pussy, not a wet ass pussy. I don't know if I can do that. Anywho, what do people think of it? Well, there's not a Robert Criscow review. However, he did comment on this. He said, this song permitted a lot of 12 year olds new insight into the moribund concept of dirty. I disagree, Criscow. There are 23 total ratings on Amazon, 4.4 out of 5 stars on average, 74% 5 star, 6% 1 star. Now, I'm going to read you a review and then I have found some other 
other reviews by the same person of different things that I'm going to read to you because I really want you to understand who this man is because it is tragic. I love it when this happens. This is by Stuck in Corona and this is from 2014. It's called My Dingling a Hit. This is the live Chuck Berry classic of My Dingling. Recently, while at a restaurant, I actually met another human being that had never heard this song. I downloaded it to my Kindle and within minutes, the entire restaurant was singing along. It is a what? great song with innuendos galore. This particular live recording is the best version of this song. Five out of five stars. Mm. So this is a man that forced an entire restaurant to sing this song with him. <laughs> Possibly at gunpoint. No, no, definitely at gunpoint. There it is. But anyway, so so stuck in Corona, he also reviewed Liquid Clog Remover by Green Gobbler. He said, spent quite some time trying to find the right clog remover for my sink. Read numerous reviews and thought this was the answer. Following the instructions to the letter and let the product work all night. Next morning, I poured a pot of boiling water into the sink, but the clog was mightier than the gobbler. Repeated the process <laughs> the next day, waiting all night. And still, the product did not work. Would not buy this product again. One out of five stars. He is- hey, Tim. <laughs> Go on. What do you think's in that drain? <laughs> I'm going to say meat. <laughs> Well, let me read his review on knee brace with side stabilizers. <laughs> Product looks well made, but claims that it fits even quote unquote chubby legs are simply not true. <laughs> the brace would not fit my leg, but might fit my 17 year old daughter's leg. Three out of five stars. So we got an overweight man here. <laughs> <laughs> this chubby legged drain clogger loves this song and made a restaurant sing it with him. I'm still hung up on the <laughs> fact that he downloaded the song to his Kindle. <laughs> What does that sentence even mean? Do Kindles play music? Is that a, did we catch him in a lie? I don't know. I think maybe, you know, I don't know. Tim, if he made up a story where <laughs> he and a group of strangers sang my dingling in a restaurant after he allegedly downloaded the song to his Kindle, what kind of sad, empty man is that? Well, he's the sort of man whose legs won't fit in knee braces and he gets, <laughs> he gets sick clogs that liquid clog remover by green. Green Gobbler cannot stand up to. Wow. Uh, you know what, Tim? We're going to have to clog some drains. I want to see if the Gobbler can stand up to a normal drain clog. Is it a poor product or is this guy asking too much of the Gobbler? <laughs> I mean, I'm sure he has a pretty serious clog, but Garrett, I am actually way ahead of you, way ahead of you, but I have a different game. I have filled each one of the drains in this house with a oh. mystery substance, and I have enough Green Gobbler to, according to their promotional materials, their literature, if you will, unclog all drains. Well, gobbler, we're going to give you the benefit of the doubt. Tim, is any of it concrete? No, no. It okay, is all good. organic material. Okay, doke. Uh, did any of it go in as a pure substance? Solid. No, it okay. all was originally a liquid. Is it ice? <laughs> no. <laughs> anyway. Um, Wait, is it concrete? I asked if it was cement. You said no. It's not cement. Anyway, Miss Ho in 2012 said, I first heard this song in a family gathering and fell in love with it. Thought it was funny. If you would like a good laugh, listen to this song, five to five stars. She doesn't know what funny is or laughing. On YouTube, Phil Mitchum said, if my aunt was still alive, today would have been her 100th birthday. She loved this song and would sing along to it every time it played. So here's to you, Auntie. Hmm. Every time it played? Yeah. That means that it's just coming on the radio or perhaps perhaps he's torturing her. Like He she's, probably downloaded it to his Kindle. Yeah. She's got some sort of rare form of OCD where she has to sing this song through start to finish every time it plays and he's just he, he downloaded it to his Kindle he's just hanging out in the like background you, like you do with me in that Bon Jovi song yeah I'm not gonna do it now I, we please don't, don't. we I, don't have the time I'm begging you not to <laughs> fantastic reviews Tim that brings us to final thoughts I, I mean, come on. What, what's there to say about this? Uh, I, I mean, it's a novelty song. It sucks. He's a good musician. This is not a good song. This is beneath him. I would like to know what the history of rock and roll would have been like had he brought this to everyone's attention instead of Johnny, Johnny Be, Be good. good. Yeah. Interesting. Well, I can't wait to find out in your sequels to 
Back to the Future, Back to the Future 2. Are they still called Back to the Future 2 and 3? Yeah. Okay. They're direct sequels to the original film, which again, I have edited. that one small change. And I mean, wow, there's two changes, Garrett. I mean, because here's the thing. (laughs) It's now a wildly different movie because of where the story goes, right? Because Marty stops being important to the story. I- So, my point is that there are two changes. One is the song. I've switched that out. And second, Mm -hmm. I've placed myself over a lot of names in the credits. Sure. And how does Godzilla fit in? Well, that's in the later movies because I didn't have a lot of foot. Garrett, (laughs) Gino and I stayed up real late every night filming for this project, but a movie- Filming? A movie takes so much footage. Did you know that? My point is- I had to use some Godzilla footage to kind of pad out what what we'd shot. (laughs) I don't know, Doc. (laughs) (laughs) Well, no, no. Let me rephrase. There is nothing from Back to the Future 2 or 3 in any of those movies. (laughs) It is, it is what I shot, the history of rock and roll from 1958's My Dingling On, plus some padding from 1998's Godzilla. Great. All right. I, I can't wait. Tim, I think I know the answer, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Do you hate this song? I'm going to surprise you, I think. Since we changed the words to My Cock and Balls, kind of like this song. God damn it. I hate this version, sure, but uh, I like the way we did it. What about you, okay. Gary? Do you hate this song? Hate you? No, I almost do, but not quite. Okay. Well, because it's it's not like it's ever played. Oh, <laughs> I've got some bad news for you for the next six to eight months of your life. What? Replaced all of your records. Garrett, I took a chisel and I changed Wait. every groove <laughs> in your records to be this song. Is that why you asked for the microscope? No, that was a different thing. This I just winged. <laughs> it's not going to sound like that. <laughs> it is. It is. I was looking at it and I copied it exactly. So rather than just replace my records with Chuck Berry, is my dingling, which is bad enough. You chose to ruin my records. No, I changed them. I mean, in all honesty, given the fact that they almost certainly sound exactly like my dingling, haven't checked yet. That's a borderline <laughs> art. And can you change them back? <laughs> I don't know. We should you, listen you to them first. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Yeah, that is thousands of dollars and hours of work. Great. I hate this song. (laughs) Yes, I did it. I hate it too, Garrett. Let's never listen to this again. (laughs) But you ruined all my records. (laughs) Yeah, but they're just shattered. I knew it was never going to sound like this. (laughs) I broke your record to the chisel. God damn. You know what? Almost forgiven. (laughs) Almost forgiven. Fair enough. Not forgiven. Oh, almost. All right, Tim, that brings us to listener mail. Would you like to go first or would you like me to? I would like me to go first. Okay. Uh, Mine is by Jason. And Jason wrote in, this is after the year in review, I believe. All right. I just wanted to say that I checked out Tim's recommendation of suburban kids with biblical names based on his description of the band, If You Like Fun. Now, I think that was actually Mm. your description. I just recommended it. I was saying, I, I meant fun. Like, if you enjoy fun music, not the band fun period. Nobody likes fun. I wasn't sure if it was fun in general or the Nate Rose Ruiz, Ruiz fronted pop band fun. Either way, I like both. The band was neither mm. fun nor was it fun. It was unfun. One out of five star recommendation. Now, Jason, I, I guess it would have been probably responsible to mention that Suburban Kids with Biblical Names is weird Swedish or possibly Danish synth pop that is not particularly representative of either of our musical tastes, but I will will stand behind the recommendation for the album number three. Marry Me, Loop Duplicate My Heart, Rent a Wreck, Noodles, which mm. are the smell of denial, you will never grow old. Noodles are the smell of denial, and you will never grow old. It's good stuff. Now, Tim, we did warn the listeners. I remember because you threw it out there, and I, I want to stand right there with you, side by side, hand in pocket. I fully support this recommendation. However, we did warn you guys, some of you will really love this album. Most of you will not. Yeah, that's fine. And it's okay to hate something we love. In fact, Tim, you put it very eloquently. This does not in any way represent either of our musical tastes, but this one particular album just scratches a certain itch that we can't explain and it's good. Yeah. Yeah. But again, it's not not for everyone. Yeah. It's not good. I like it. Yeah. Makes me feel safe. Yeah. Warm too. Safe and warm. Mm, Fair enough. (laughs) It makes you feel like you're in Sweden or possibly the Dane. 
Uh, where are the Danes from? Yeah, we'll, we'll look it up later. Yeah, all right. What what listener mail do you have, Garrett? My email, Tim, is from someone who I didn't write down. Alexandra, maybe? Anyway, maybe Alex wrote, greetings and salutations, boys. However you say it. Boys. God damn it. <laughs> you don't. I just re-listened to your 6699 episode and wanted to share a few notes. Episode notes, Tim. These are always good. Critical feedback. I don't care for this. No, you don't. 6699 is pronounced 6699, and I will not be convinced otherwise. Well, yeah, yeah we told you that. Well, you argued uh, against it for years, but I think you're on board now. Yeah, well, Tim, I'll fight you every step of the- Well, geez, I shouldn't set this precedent, should I? Uh, uh, yeah, m- uh, most of the- the time you will wear me down. Oh, given a long enough most most of the time. Can anyway, I microwave these hands again? God damn it! Quit putting holes in the microwave. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, maybe Alex continues, unless maybe I get a concussion from being pistol whipped by 6699 and I forget how the English language works. Next, 6699 being cool with both the Bloods and the Crips violence gangs makes me imagine him as Todd in Bojack Horseman, where he ends up courting both the gangs in prison. I think this is an original thought, but I might have been something one of you said in a later episode. I don't, I don't think know. so. I had a 2008 Kia Rondo, affectionately named Rondo Rousey by my boyfriend, <laughs> for almost a year until it caught fire on the way to the mechanic back in May. I ended up scrapping her since she had a ton of other problems anyway. I guess my point with the Rondo story is also a tragic one, except I got 200 bucks out of it and I don't have to deal with car expenses. What does this have to do with 6699? Maybe she'll go on. Okay. Next here she has, these are just bullets. She's listed (laughs) bullets. (laughs) <laughs> well, yeah, in in typical fashion, Tim, I only read the first sentence of the email, and if it strikes me rich, I stop immediately so that we can both be surprised. Anyway, the next bullet, if 6699 can bend the rules of grammar and pronunciation, may I suggest your rap names? Oh, fantastic. May I suggest your rap names be g Easy and t Easy, but you pronounce it g and t <laughs> You can decide if that's a hard or soft G. Ew, geezy. <laughs> yeah, we're uh, going with g and t what if it's a yeah, soft uh, T? Well, she goes on. I would say the same for the hard or soft T, but that usually gets answered at the top of the show anyway. She's talking about how you always announce whether or not you're aroused. Oh, clever. She's, yeah. Clever. Yeah. Your dingling is a hard T in this instance. Hmm. I'm sorry I used that word. I should have said cock and balls. Anyway, that's all for now. As always, Tim is a swole trucker. Now I don't even remember what that's supposed to be. Yes. That's that's one of the weirder emails we've had. Yeah, that was by Alexander. Sandra. Oh, looked look it at up that while you were talking. I was wondering what you were typing away at over there. Yeah. Well, that's one of the things. All right. Well, that's going to bring us over to Music News of the Weird. I'll ask it, though. I'm sure I know what the answer is. Would you like to go first, Tim, or would you like me to? Well, Garrett, before either of us goes, we have a new jingle. Oh, my God, we do. Yeah, this is created by Coltrane McQuarrie. Garrett believes that to be a real name. I do not. <laughs> Almost certainly a made-up name. Who gave us a Music News of the Weird jingle, which we will play... Now. 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 Music news of the weird. Delightful. Thank you, sir. You've lied about your name, but that was delightful. Great. So, Tim, who's going first? You go first. Oh, my God. The Grammy nominations have come out for 2021, and have you heard the controversy? I have not. Three of the five acts nominated for Best Children's Album are saying, no, thank you. They're upset that the contenders in their category are all white males. Oh. Alistair Mook, Dog on Fleas, and Okie Dokie Brothers are self-described white guys with guitars and did not feel that it was an even playing field, and if the, no people of color were going to be nominated, they would rather not be considered. Now, Tim, I'm not really here to say whether or not that's a good idea. It's their prerogative. They can do what they want. What I am here to point out is taking a strong moral stand, whether right or wrong, with the name Dogs on Fleas, Alistair Mook, or the Okie Dokie Brothers is both ridiculous and hilarious. People said the same thing about Rosa Parks' name, Garrett. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. We may have to cut that. <laughs> no. No, that's good stuff. You're probably right. They probably Probably didn't. These are ridiculous names, and uh, they should not be considered our thought leaders. What do you got, Tim? In everybody is selling their entire catalog news, all artists are selling their entire catalogs. And while we as a podcast probably can't afford to own the collected works of Bob Dylan, we could probably own like a Carly Simon, I think. I don't know, Tim. I mean, not nearly as many hits, but who... So, rattle it off. Who all is selling their entire catalog? Well, Bob Dylan sold 60 
three years worth of music, more than 600 songs, to Universal Music Publishing Group for 300 to 400 million dollars, uh, about two thirds of a million dollars per song. Stevie Nicks sold most of her catalog to Primary Wave for about a hundred million dollars. David Crosby is attempting to sell his catalog. He's apparently far more down on his luck. He wrote, I am selling mine also. I can't work. And streaming stole my record money. I have a family and a mortgage and I have to take care of them. So it's my only option. I'm sure the others feel the same. Now, we're going to have to look into the financial mechanics of streaming because don't you have to grant them access to your music? Yes. So I guess he's saying because people expect it to be on streaming, no one's buying music anymore, I guess. It's more. Yeah, probably. Indirect. Yeah. Also, if you think about the Graham Nash, the Neil Young, the Stephen Stills, like he's got some hits, but they were super early Crosby, Stills, and Nash hits, and they were never as big as the other three. Like he doesn't even have a love the one you're with, much less a Neil Young catalog. Oh, sure. No, no. Hey, listen, I'm not here to say that David Crosby should have more money than he does. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Also, speaking of musician criminals. Oh, yeah. That guy's amazing. Yeah. We could do a prep episode. This would be, I know you won't do it because you refuse to do any research, but in in some sort of weird, ironic life bit. But in any way, you could do a prep episode on the crimes of David Crosby and it would be a really fun prep episode. Or you could do it. I did the long one. Yeah, you could do a long one. That's what I'm saying. Now, there's not enough to do like a full episode, but we could do a prep episode on it. All right. Well, we'll discuss later. Garrett, what other news do you have? Well, Tim, Justin Bieber has a few things he wants you to know. One, he is not a member of the Hillsong Church. Two, he is not studying to be a pastor. That's that, that's about it. No, um, okay. <laughs> but most importantly, Tim, he wants you to know that church is not a place. Church is the people that gather together to worship together, to become a community together. Like this show. Absolutely, Tim. This show is not you and I. You and I are merely the vessels through which our listeners flow. Right. I am the God's head, the keeper of all things in this life. Absolutely. Look upon my works. And tremble. (laughs) There it is. Now, Tim, having said all that, making it very clear that where you attend church is not nearly as important as the message being delivered there. He also wants to be super clear he is not a part of that church. Hmm. So that seemed a little weird to me. Basically, there was a big article how he was uh, allegedly studying to be a pastor and he was a member of this Hillsong church that he does not want to be a part of. So I, I started doing a little research and after I did some digging, here's what I learned. Biebs may not be a member of this church, but he has a multi-year history with it. He's been attending services there, I mean, for a de- for the better part of a decade, from when he was his release of journals and purpose. I think that was the one you and I did. Even in 2013, he posted a photo with the organization's very high-profile pastor, a guy named Carl Lentz, with the caption, quote, love you, bro. <laughs> now, Tim, Lentz, when I saw this photo, looks like a real Rennie. Super oh, no. scumbag. Does he have a meaty so head? Did, no, 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 no. Sorry, sorry. Just like a piece of shit. <laughs> oh, allegedly. <laughs> oh, sure, sure. Absolutely. Looks can be deceiving. So I did some Googling. Here's what I found. Lentz is famous for being a pastor at the Manhattan Hillsong Church since 2010. When he famously baptized Bieber, whom the pastor referred to as, quote, buckaroo, in the bathtub of New York Knicks star Tyson Chandler's Manhattan home. Oh, my God. (laughs) Now, that was according to a 2015 GQ profile. If you read further into this profile, you also learn that in 2013... Bieber briefly moved in with Lentz. I think maybe in 2014. I mean, we've then all Tim moved after- Garrett, Garrett, we've all moved in with our pastor at one time or another. <laughs> Very unusual. Very <laughs> unusual. <laughs> Big red flag. Now, Tim, there was a then after all this very particular timeline, things get hazy. There's a very non specified falling out with very scant details about which I could not find any. And suddenly, Lentz and Beeb stopped talking to each other completely. Cut to November 2020, where news broke that Pastor Lentz was fired for, quote, leadership issues and breaches of trust, plus a recent revelation of moral failures, end quote. Oh, he had sex with that beeb. Whoa, whoa, no. Allegedly. Super allegedly. But I don't think so. Did he try to? Maybe. Everything I just read is insane. Also, if you look up this guy, real creep show. Hmm. He did something bad enough that he both lost his job and his marriage. 
Oh, huh. I think. Usually it's just one or the other. Typically. Yeah. God, isn't it horrible when the poor spouse has to stand next to the creep and be like, I support my husband. Oh, yeah. I'm sure he didn't B T or K. He did. He did, he did all of those things. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I beat and teed, but I didn't K. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh. I, Tim, you've invented a new vernacular that I regret having been born of the show. <laughs> Feel free to Jesus. use it. Spread in America and the world. We see you, Brazil. Nice. Yeah. In Garrett's boy, Rivers Cuomo is also selling music too, in addition to those other guys. But instead of his entire catalog, it is 86 hours of unreleased demos that no one in their right mind could possibly want. News. Challenge. Uh, yeah, he's doing all that. How many did you say? 86 hours. Oh, never mind. We just, <laughs> we just can't. We just can't. Uh, anyway, Riv C apparently likes making apps and he makes made an online market of songs as part of a programming class he's taking. He tweeted out on December 8th, 2020, for my web programming class final project, I made a web market stocked with 2,655 previously unreleased demos and then gives the website, which I will not read here. There are nine included demo collections, each priced at $9 that range between 90 minutes and 38 hours. There's also a (sighs) best of the demos compilation that runs or that comes in at only 82 minutes. It's actually so much material that Riv C cannot be bothered to listen to it all before releasing it. He also asked his fans, he said, please let me know if there's anything I wouldn't want public in all the voice notes. I never thought I'd be releasing those. I don't know what's in them. Thank you. How much is it? $81, I think, for the whole thing. Too much. It's too much. (laughs) Yeah, but Garrett, think about all the news stories we could break listening to those voice notes. Oh my God. God. Here's a fun game, Tim. Every night when we go to bed, we put on our respective Walkmans and we listen to the the voice notes of Rivers Cuomo. Oh God, I think we'd both kill ourselves so quickly. Because here's the problem. You fall asleep to that and it keeps playing and it starts to subconsciously affect you, Garrett. (laughs) I don't want to use the word allegedly here because this is a clinical diagnosis. Uh, Gross. Yeah. No, he is medically gross. (laughs) Uh, What other news do you have, Gary, my dear? <laughs> Don't ever do that again. Uh, that's that's funny once. Um, <laughs> but seriously, I will slap that face off. Tim, our inspiration for the now hit duo Texas Toast, one Florida Georgia line, might be calling it quits. You heard about this? Nope. Well, in an exhausting and rambling video call posted to their Twitter, the pair explained that they were not breaking up, but just taking time to explore some solo projects. Wait, now, we can just do that? They can just do that? N- n- we can't do that. They can do that. Oh. Anyway, now I watched this video and the story itself, not that interesting, except for the fact that this now means that we're going to have Florida Georgia. Georgia line albums to listen to, and then Florida albums, and then Georgia albums. Ooh. But watching the video, it is like watching two parents telling their kids they're getting divorced, where one parent's like, yeah, I've already got a side piece and uh, an apartment downtown. And the other one's like, I'm completely on board with this too. Yeah. We made this decision together. And the other one's Tim. (laughs) Correct. Yes. And the other one is Tim. So the whole video is basically Brian Kelly explaining that while in quarantine, he's written many songs and doesn't really understand why he would split that money with Tyler Hubbard. So he's going to be doing a lot of solo work. And then Tyler's just kind of like nodding and be like, we both are, <laughs> but but they're not, Tim. So this is all in all likelihood, the moment in which Brian Kelly will be Justin Timberlaking, aka beyonce aka Paul Simoning his way out of this Florida and or Georgia menage nightmare. And do we know if he is Florida or Georgia? Remains unclear. Okay. So we don't know if we will be getting new music from Florida or Georgia, only that we will not be getting new music from both. Oh, I think we'll get new music from both. I think that one will be bad and one will be Feldman-y. <laughs> oh, well, we'll do the Feldman one. Yeah, of course. We always take the low road. What else you got, Timmy? Well, Gary, in Is Paul McCartney Crazy or Just Old and Bad at Metaphors news, Paul McCartney would like you to know that he regularly speaks to George Harrison through a tree that George bought him once. Mm. George was very into horticulture and he was a really good gardener. The legendary Grammy winner told NPR's All Things Considered 
considered. He gave me the tree as a present. It's a big fir tree, and it's by my gate. As I was leaving the house on the morning of December 18th, I got out of the car close to the gate and looked up at the tree and said, Hi, George. There he is, growing strongly. That takes me back to the time when I hitchhiked with him. Hmm, shouldn't. Uh... Yes. Now, let me read a comment, a response. This was, I think this was a Fox News article, so the comments are even crazier than usual. This is by Independent 11. This was on December 31st, 2020. I hope Paul is only talking to himself because Jesus made it clear that the dead cannot talk to the living. In the parable of the rich man (laughs) in Lazarus, Jesus said, and then he quotes a bunch from the Bible. He goes on to say, some people point to the story in 1 Samuel chapter 28 about King Saul and the witch of Endor. That sounds like Star Wars. uh, As as proof (laughs) that people can talk to the dead. But notice verses 13 to 14, which only say the lady saw a ghostly figure that looked like an old man. Saul assumed it was Samuel. She probably saw a devil. <laughs> anyway, so what a twist. The point the point is that the devil might be communicating to Paul McCartney through a tree claiming to be George Harrison. I is assumed. my news story. <laughs> Your news story is incredible. I assumed that before you gave us the full quote that Paul McCartney just one time walked up to a tree that George Harrison gave him, quietly put his hand on it, wept softly and was like, "You're the only one that was nice to me." <laughs> Sad but true. Yeah. Who wants to take shit from Ringo? (laughs) He was so mean. People don't know that. Ringo? Mean guy. Well, people really don't know, you know, why he wore those rings. Oh my God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For the punch. It hurts twice as hard. Yep. Okay. Tim, that brings us to my favorite part of the episode where we announce what album we're going to be talking about one week from today. So Tim, let's not waste another moment. What are we going to be putting in our ear holes for an entire seven days? We will be listening to System of a Down's Toxic released exactly seven days before 2001's (laughs) 9-11. Is that why we're doing it? No. I just thought it was an interesting fact. I judge all time. (laughs) I know. Okay. I know. All All time is number of days and hours before or since 9-11. Yes. I operate on a B and E and a A and E calendar. Right. We're cutting all of this. Anyway, the point is, have you ever heard this album? I don't know what this is. I don't really know either. I feel like this is going to be one of those albums that I'm going to know like nine songs from. (laughs) I really hope I don't. This is going to be one of those albums that I've heard every song on the radio in Houston going to fucking high school and had no idea what any of this was. I'm already kind of angry about it. I don't even know time period. I'm guessing early aughts. 2001. Oh, 9/11. that's right. 9-11. Seven days before 9-11. Yeah. I'm going to guess I know two of the songs on this album. Which album are we doing? Toxicity. Well, Toxicity. let me rephrase. We're doing Toxicity, and then in two weeks from one week from now, we'll, of course, be doing System of a Down's Steal This Album. Why would we ever do two albums in a row? Well, we'll see how the first one goes. Yeah, no, listen, I'm just announcing it now, so we're locked in. Just so we, yeah, so yeah, we don't have to think it. about which one we're going to do. Oh, no. Anyway, we next- so many good suggestions. <laughs> if anybody is still listening. Listeners, do you want to hear Kevin Federline's album? Oh, so many people did initially and then they stopped asking for it. We got to do I it. Think I think those people killed it. themselves. Okay, that's tragic. I want to do it. I want to listen to it. I want you to listen to it. If it helps, we probably won't listen to two of the tracks because I don't think they're available on the internet. I thought you found them all. I found all of them except for like intro and something. It doesn't matter. Oh, okay. We're doing it. We'll do. Okay, so here's what we'll do. Now, System of a Down it. Toxicity next week. Following that prep episode, not sure yet. Following that, Kevin Federline's Play With Fire, which is, I think, a reference to the Rolling Stones song. Mm, I doubt it. Absolutely not to all of that. System of a Down, first album. That's all I'm committing to today. Nobody made you the czar of what we do. Well, feel like your laziness sees it. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I'm not going to get into it. Yeah. We don't need to bring our private business to the show. We don't talk about our (laughs) private lives on this show. All right, folks. As always, if you can rate, review, subscribe anywhere that you can do that, ideally on the Apple Podcast app. That's where it seems to make the most difference. But hey, once Spotify maybe someday has some way to rate us, 
do that. But until you can, if you can get somebody else to listen to it, that's the best thing you can do. Barring that, you can also reach out to us. You can go to heypod.com, get the album, every episode we've ever done in every format. We just leave them up there. You can download them, remix them, add a beat. I don't know. We want to hear from you though. And you can click on contact us in the upper left-hand corner and that will give you a contact form where it asks for an email. That's just so we can reply. We're not going to market at you. We don't even save it. We just, it's just, we just archive it. We don't do anything with it. Or you can just email us directly at heypodmail at gmail.com and we want to hear about it. We want to know what stories you have about these songs, these albums, theories. We want to see your artwork. We've been getting some amazing emails lately and we'll feature them here on a prep episode. You can also reach out to us on Instagram at HatePod, Twitter, it's Album Hate Pod. We've got subreddits, we've got Discord servers, we've got... Uh, well, that's actually about all we've got, right, Tim? Yes. Facebook.com slash hate pod. But Jesus, what are you, 80? Get off Facebook for the love of God. Get on the gram. For why I hate this album, I have been one of your hosts, Garrett Harvey. I have been Gordon Eversall. And on September 2nd, 2015, Garrett Harvey said, of all the secret wars, I would say I'm happiest about this one. Try to guess which war, folks. <laughs> Yemen, Syria, Turkey, North Africa. It was Turkey. It was Turkey. <laughs> Cowboys running through my dreams Nothing's quite the way it seems well, I joined the Navy I got kicked out in a week My facial features aren't distinct I try to find some meaning in these songs Genius is a genius, got it wrong. Well, it's a lobster murder sex thing, the bleaching of the hair, full of salt on both your ears. The riffs are too repetitive, the lyrics make no sense. All the songs are B sides, the cover art's a mess. There's so much hair to tear apart Listen to it for a week Now the week has passed It's the Why I Hate This Album Podcast Tim and Gary.